over 65 had problems accessing healthcare services during the past year due to cost. That's the US. And those are all the other countries. So despite our spending, we still have these enormous barriers to accessing um, healthcare. So, those are the problems. Now, because I'm an optimist, let's move on to fixing this state of affairs. So there are five solutions. And, so, and this is where thinking about population health science as a cogent field of inquiry, thinking about quantitative population health science as being at the root of that and making an argument for epidemiology to embrace the role as being at the heart of quantitative population health science comes in. The five solutions. And number one ties in very much to the uh, name of this lectureship after, after Dr. Castle is focusing on the ineluctable role of context. So we have had this very interesting, interesting phenomenon in population health science where over the past 15, 20 years, we have come to grudgingly accept that context matters. And um, you know, it's been this explosion of multi-level thinking, sometimes coupled with life force thinking. It's like finally context matters. Good. Well, it's not that context matters. It's actually that actually very little else matters. If you're interested in improving the health of populations, this is where the money is. Where the yield is, is actually in context. And we need to stop thinking about context. It's like every single time when there is you know, something like the million person um, cohort that's now being proposed for Christian medicine, and it's like whenever I've discussed that at NIH, I get it's no, no, but it's okay. We're going to add some measures of context. Well, the argument should be right now. Actually, if you care about improving health populations, you need to convince me to add some, some measures of individual just to add them in. But really, what matters is context. And we need to stop. Thinking of context as, um, as extra. Let me give a couple of examples on that. Um, um, I, was, um, I was in New York City, had the privilege of serving New York City Health Board, being involved in some colossal failures. Um, uh, this was the attempt to actually get the state soda tax, um, which was completely um, snowed by um, the um, beverage in, in association with it, which changed the culture. Here's a quote in the New York Times the Beverage industry has outstanding the pro tax side, has succeeded in being the soda tax as a mere money grab cleverly disguised as a health policy, where the uh, soda industry was successful in changing context. They changed culture around the soda tax. We lost. And then we tried to do um, uh, the uh, soda size ban, which of course, again, we lost. This was also painted as a, as a paternalistic approach from the nanny state, um, resulting in uh, the appellate court eventually striking down um, uh, the uh, soda size ban. And why did we lose? Because we lost on um, context. We lost on the framing of this issue. We lost the fact this issue is not a ban. It's not a ban. It's simply a packaging regulation, much like everything else. You cannot buy Cheerios the size of this desk. Why? <laughs> Maybe you should. It's the nanny state. It's keeping you from buying Cheerios. And if you have kids like mine, you actually want to buy Cheerios the size of this desk. Why can't I do that? The man is holding you back. Well, no. It's it's a it's, it's a packaging. It's packaging, and uh, it's it's it was. It's part of context that ultimately determines everything we do. Now, let me show you one quantitative example because I don't just um, use rhetoric. So, let me show you a simple, simple uh, math, which is this. Everybody here, all here is part of the university, you're here as, a, as part of a distinguished university. So, everybody here is smart by definition. Um, uh, or else, you know, you wander down the street. But, uh, so here's a question Let's assume everybody here is smart, and let's assume that you all know that two things matter for your brains. One, genes. And the other one is some sort of environment, right? You sort of work some sort of environment. So let's assume that those two are true. You can argue with me later if you think one of the two, two is not true, but I think it's, we can agree on that. So I'm going to ask you a question. What percent of your smarts, your cognitive ability, is due to your genes? You don't have to answer out loud, but I would like everybody to have an answer in their head. It's not only once we go back and erase it, I want you to be honest. So what percent of your smarts is due to your genes? Everybody have an answer? Okay. So let's just do the math. So I'm going to do a simple simulation to show the answer, and then I'm going to show you real data. But first, I'm going to do a simulation. And um, the simulation is very straightforward. It says there are two things that make you smart and two things are not. A gene, it's a ridiculous common variant hypothesis. There is a brain gene, okay? And there is a, a smartogenic environment. Those are the only two factors. The two factors have to co occur for you to be smart. So I'm going to create people with the gene, people in the smart genetic environment. If you have the two, you become smart. The only exception I'm making is I'm creating a few dandelions, people who are smart no matter what. We all know this people. They're freakish. Like, their, parents are, their parents are stupid. They're in a bad environment. They're still smart. So I'm trying to get a few freakishly smart people just to try to make create life. And also because otherwise I have zero denominators. So I have to do that. Okay? So here's my setup. 
Here's the population again. Um, this is the black is the smart gene. So gene plus, and by the way, these 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 people in this exact pattern are going to stay with the smart gene that I'm going to show you. That doesn't change. Okay, so the black is the smart gene, and graphically, green is the smart genetic environment. And black plus green become red with the exception of the few random reds who are the people over here. So let me show you the scenario. Well, the scenario here is scenario one. Scenario one is a smartogenic, almost ubiquitous smartogenic environment. You see it? The green almost everywhere. These reds are the random smart dandelions. But look, at here's the black genes. I'm now showing it to you as dots, just so that you can see it behind the, behind the green. See the smart gene? So the smart gene plus green are going to become red. So you'll see black dots plus green becomes red. Okay? So the question is, what percent of um, people's brains are due to their genes? Well, if you look carefully, you see that everybody who's smart, with the exception of the rare dandelions, had the gene, right? You see that? So when you do the relative risk, and you can do the math yourself, relative risk of brains being genes is about four, and the part population of risk proportion is about one, which means 100% of people's brains are due to their genes. That's the answer. Well, let's keep the genes exactly the same. Same gene pattern, same deadlines, only now the smart genetic environment is very little. So only those two people are now going to convert from uh, green, black to red. You do the math, what's the relative risk of brains giving genes? Well, there are a lot of people with genes who are not smart now. So relative risk, reasonably enough, is lower, it's 1.7, the part is 0.4, 40%. So the answer to the question, what percent of your brains is due to your genes? Now you all have to look at your soul and you can decide how right you are. Unless you said, I cannot answer that question unless I know the environment, you were wrong. So, this is not rhetoric, this is just math. As long as we accept the notion that brains, that genes and environment both matter, you cannot answer one without the other. And that is true for everything. I'm just using that as an example. By the way, is this all theoretical? You know, you're an epidemiologist, and some of you may have heard rumors that I've dabbled in the dark arts of, like, you know, ancient based models, so it's like, there must be some witchcraft behind it. That's actually not theoretical at all. People like Eric Turkheim have been publishing this for a decade. This is uh, showing uh, the proportion of genetic variance. It is explained, this is for IQ, proportion of IQ variance explained by genes, and SCS, showing that among richer family, there's a lot more variance around, um, there's a lot more of uh, IQ variance explained by genes. Essentially, in rich families, the math works out that to show that your IQ is all due to your genes, which is exactly what I showed you before. So we've known this. We've known this for, this is 2003, which is like, you know, some of you are not even born then. So it's like, we've known this for a long time. <laughs> and um, so for anybody here, now maybe you all got the answer to the question right. But anybody here who answered the question I asked you with a percent, right? You should have known what was wrong. And we've known this for a long time. So number, so number two, was the, number one was the intellect of the role of context. Number two, by any methods necessary. So the definition of epidemiology, which is my discipline, which I would argue should be the cohort quantitative uh, population health science discipline, is we're interested in understanding the causes of, of health, causes of distributions of health, so that we may do something about them. Nowhere does it say comma using only a rigidly defined set of methods. However, despite that, we still quite a bit enjoy arguing about whether certain methods should be part of epidemiology or not. Um, one of the recent challenges, of course, is things like obesity. This is um, um, David, after having eaten pizza. Um, um, and uh, so questions. So what causes obesity? I remember I showed you the foresight diagram before. Many things cause obesity. Can we agree that poor food environments probably are a cause of obesity? Probably. Can we agree that poor primary education is a cause of obesity? Probably. This is New York City. These are uh, poor food environment neighborhoods that are bad food environment neighborhoods. And a fair bit of papers written about this. This is a map of New York City showing the uh, poor um, uh, schools by absenteeism, the dark um, colored neighborhoods here, the dark brown, are also poor school environments. So you ask the question, if you want to do something, what's the greatest return on investment to lower obesity, improving food store availability, or improving school quality? And the question is, how do you answer that? Should we be able to answer that? Absolutely, of course we should be able to answer that. I mean, otherwise, how else are we going to provide guidance? And how do we do this? Well, we actually can't do it with the canonical methods that we have accepted in population health science thus far. You can try to do it with um, Things like dynamic systems models. This is a paper that we actually have just just been pressed now, looking at uh, showing that actually, if you want to ask the question which one's better, improving food store availability or school quality, actually food store availability, which is right here, does nothing. It really hardly changes your BMI or baseline. What really matters is primary education. 
Is this analysis right or wrong? I don't know. It's just one analysis. And uh, you know, you should all do your own analysis and show that our analysis is wrong. That's not the point. The point is that we need to be bold in saying we should be able to embrace any method necessary so that we can actually get that answer in questions that are fundamental to the Number two. Number three. We need to be honest about the trade-offs that we need to have between uh, health equity and efficiency. So what do I mean by that? Well, this is a, a country of extraordinary health haves and health have-nots. Um, white women in Minnesota expect to live to age 83. Black men in Arkansas can expect to live to age 68. It's a 15-year life uh, expectancy gap, which is roughly the same life expectancy gap between Switzerland and Nicaragua. It is the country that we have created. So in public, public health, we talk a lot about how we want to improve the health of all populations. We also talk a lot about how we want to narrow health gaps. However, we seldom talk about the fact that actually the, uh, an efficient approach to improving the health of populations is almost always in contradiction with the goal of narrowing health gaps. And that is very much, it, it, it's self-evident as long as the health haves are more likely to benefit more from an intervention than the health have-nots, an intervention that aims to be efficiently improving population health is likely to widen the health gap. And we don't wrestle with that. This is from the diagram from the book. Um, uh, so let's say you have no intervention. Let's say you have two groups. This group has uh, um, 50 dallies. This group has 25 dallies. You do an intervention. You add one dally. This is a little bit just of life here. As long as you're adding up those dallies proportional to your baseline dallies, you're going to widen inequality by 25 to 25.5. If you add 10 dallies, 10 here, 5 there, you're going to widen by 30. And just to show you the intervention paradigm, so suppose you have two groups that are exactly equal, cool, but one group is richer, one group is poorer. And if you intervene, and what you're now doing is you're increasing the baseline, this is 60 dollars, is 5 dollars, you have an inequality of 5 dollars. Unless you design interventions that are explicitly intended to privilege the disadvantage, you are going to improve overall population health at the expense of widening health gaps. And that is a challenge that we have not wrestled with. We have not actually accepted this, we have not been honest about it, and ultimately, as far as I'm concerned, it needs to be a core part of population health science. Number three. Number four. The focus on what matters most. So we're kind of bad at this one. Um, um, and um, we have allowed the societal discussion to gallop ahead and focusing on things that don't really matter. Let me show you one example. Um, uh, this is um, rates of gun deaths per 100,000 children and teens in high income countries. This is the US, and that's all the other countries. So um, I think there's a problem. Um, um, what happens every single time there is a uh, school shooting or a mass shooting in this country, well, two things, three things have happened. Number one, more people are going to vote for Donald Trump. Number two is that uh, there are more people buy guns. And number three, a range of politicians stand up and say, the person, the shooter, he almost thought to he, um, had mental illness. Therefore, the answer is let's keep guns out of the hands of people with mental illness. Right? So maybe the answer is to make sure that guns are not in the hands of people with mental illness. Well, is it true that people with mental illness, people with psychiatric disorders are more violent? Yeah, it's true. Actually, this is a uh, national community survey. People number of diagnoses, person violent, more diagnoses, more likely to be violent. So there's base validity to that, and we have obviously allowed politicians to say this because they say it all the time, and newspapers say it all the time. Every single time you see there's a gun, there's a shooting, you will see um, uh, politicians say this. And by the way, you will see editorials and influential papers and influential psychiatrists to say that the answer is that should make sure women to most don't get access to guns. This has resulted in um, um, more funding for uh, gun background checks. And this is uh, the uh, National Instant Check System. This is the number of um, um, mental health records for disqualified people for gun ownership since 2007. An exponential increase. So, is this likely to make any difference? Is it likely to make any difference to firearm related violence? So, how can we actually assess this? Well, it's hard to assess it. But, um, you know, we could use a natural experiment comparing us to uh, the neighboring country, Canada. Now, for those of you who haven't been to Canada, for many American seniors who've been to Canada, we have this sort of notion that Canadians are just very different, and the rest of us are like a gnomish, elfish uh, culture that goes along with snow. Having spent a fair bit of my time in Canada, I can assure you that they are exactly the same as Americans, only they like the Kardashians less. Um, so, um, the, uh, so, Canada. Well, let's call Canada psychiatric disorders, US and Canada. Well, this is lifetime problems, psychiatric disorders, US and Canada. As US, and anxiety disorder, major depression, bipolar disorder, is the same as Canada, a little bit lower, but not very much lower. So is that what's driving the difference? In it? Well, like how about the homicide rates? You think with these numbers, homicide rates should be very similar. Because homicide rates in the US just can So what's causing the difference? What's causing the difference mentally with those orders? It's gun ownership. So it's ultimately differences in gun availability that underlie the difference in the reserve with respect to gun deaths in this country. And this is this is 
mean, this is elementary, right? This is elementary population of science. But we, in our science, have been muddy enough about this to allow a discourse that is going down completely wrong way. Number four. Number five. And then I'll conclude. I think the fifth prescription of tradition on in the book is to embrace what we call the intellectual and moral challenges of our time. And uh, you know, in public health, we have ridden for a long time on the coattails of uh, smoking. It's, uh, it's amazing mm -hmm. how much, but we've been lucky. Like, you know, we had John Snow and cholera, and then that lasted us a hundred years. <laughs> and then we, then we hit smoking. We're like, God, nothing else to do until like 2150. Um, uh, this is smoking, it's not actually, it's great, it's great. People smoke less, people die less. Um, um, well, let me show you the case study. So this is a case study. This is car deaths in the United States in the 20th century. So this is the 20th century down here. So this is the uh, end of prohibition, there's a spike in car deaths. So supposing you're sitting here in 1937, right? Prohibition has ended and you're like, oh my goodness, now people can drink alcohol, it's terrible. It actually was that. Um, um, and look, a lot of people are dying from cars, and uh, the scar thing doesn't seem to be it's going to go away. What should we do? Let's do something about it. What should we do? Well, we can argue back and forth. And there are two things we can do, right? So what are you going to do? Do you want to invest in more driving lessons for every drivers, or better roads and better cars? You want to invest in You can choose. Now, does that sound absurd to you? It's absurd. We make this discussion, we have this discussion all the time. Obesity, big problem. What do you want to choose to do? You want to choose to tell people to eat less, or you want to choose to reduce the soup? food portion sizes. Which one do we choose? We choose this nearly all the time. In fact, luckily, this is not what we chose in the 1930s. What we actually chose is the latter. We chose that. And that's what's happened to number motor vehicle deaths. So we make the right choice then. I would argue we make the wrong choice all the time now. Let me show you one more slide about the, the sort of intellectual challenges of our time, how the moral challenges of our time. Remember I said context is, a, context is an electable word. What are the features of context that are driving health? I'm sure you can think of many, but let me just ask you one. Everybody here knows life expectancy is going up. I'll show you that, right? Everybody here knows that life expectancy is probably not going up for everybody. Right? It's going up for a certain proportion of people, or a certain proportion is not going up. Let me ask you a question. For what proportion of people in this country is life expectancy not gone up in the past 30 years? You can answer it in your head. So make sure and answer if you want. The proportion of people for whom life expectancy has not gone up in the past 30 years is 80%. Right, life expectancy has gone up for the top, for the richest quintile, 20%. Poorest quintile has gone down, for the middle street quintile has stayed exactly the same. So, in the context of context is ineluctable, how can this not be a central feature to anything that we do in population health science? So I'm going to end on two metaphors, um, uh, and then I'll stop and leave some time for questions. Um, um, first, a uh, soccer metaphor. This is um, this is the best uh, sports team in this country, which is the US Women's uh, National Team, which uh, for those of you who are not at the wake, um, won the World Cup. Um, um, why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this because uh, the way soccer is played, for those of you who don't know, is there's a goalie, there's Hope Solo in red, and then there's 10 other players. Okay? Um, from a health point of view, the goalie who is there to keep the ball from going to the net is the doctor. You want a good goalie. Hope Solo is a very good goalie. Terrible thing to be a great goal. Um, uh, she is very good at keeping the ball from going into the net. Right? And when you're sick, when I'm sick, I want to have a good doctor. I want to be very clear that my talk should not in any way be misconstrued as saying that I don't want a good doctor. I want to make sure that the ball does not go into the net. That's what a good goal does. But I would like to live in a society where, in order to promote population health, we have 10 other players who are pushing the ball upstream on the social, economic, cultural factors ultimately make people healthy. And that is what we can do in terms of pushing the rational population on science. My last metaphor rests on my pet goldfish. The goldfish. I love my goldfish and I would like my goldfish to be healthy. So what do I do? Well, I tell my goldfish, I want you to exercise <laughs> and to swim around your bowl 10 times clockwise, 10 times clockwise every day. Number one. Number two, I tell my goldfish when I give those little flaky things that I feed you. I want you not to gobble and not to eat too much. Number three, you should have safe goldfish sex. No, it's by yourself. <laughs> you imagine that you know, I know it's not ridiculous, but this is what we do, right? This is what we do. Of course, what am I missing? Well, what I'm missing is the fact that unless the water in the bowl is clean regularly, the goldfish is going to be sick no matter what. That ultimately, as far as I'm concerned, should be the core of population health science, and that's what we are trying to do. We're trying to shift the intellectual agenda away from our individualistic focus with all the methodological um, 
So with all the long tail of metallurgical thinking that goes with it into a way where we start thinking more about the water and developing and flourishing as a field of population health science to the end of improving water populations. I'll stop there. Thank you very much for having me. Sandro, I have to say, I like this lecture even more than I liked the one you gave in 2014 in Silver Spring at the American College of Epidemiology. <laughs> thank you. So thank you. Um, I guess my question is, you were saying what we have done and what we have not done in terms of public health, but do you think that public health policy is actually an emergent phenomenon of what comes out of all the different actors competing to influence it? And that if we want to see a better result, what epidemiology might be able to do, would be to understand more what <coughs> underlies the decision-making and the thinking, the cognitive processes, maybe even the neurobiological processes, of the people who are the biggest influentials. Yeah, I, um, I thought the lately we were sort of quite obsessed with this notion about how is it that sort of policy happens, like what are the various players, and are there are many very smart books written about that, so I wouldn't even mention that there are um, I think we, and I'm speaking we here as the academic community, so the home crowd, um, have a clear role in that. And um, I suppose I, I frame my talk as saying there are a lot of different actors who have a lot of blame for the state of affairs. I'm not interested in blaming others. I'm actually interested in looking inward and saying, what is our role? And uh, what I try to do is to say, look, there are five things that I think are misdirections that we've taken here, five different ways we could do it differently. And uh, will that be enough? Absolutely not. I think us still getting things right is neither necessary nor sufficient to use the terminology. Um, but it's certainly a cause of us as societies getting it right. I think the other element which I didn't talk about here at all then becomes the role of universities. And I think the role of universities is three things and three things alone. Number one is we generate knowledge and ideas. Number two is we, think and, uh, we teach and learn. And number three, which is the, what we don't do well, is we should be in the business of translating what we know. We should be in the business of making sure that what we know is accessible in a way that is influential towards policy. I think we should, not be we should not be afraid of having an activist population on science, but the word activist meaning a conduit towards social change. I think that's what attracts us to the academy, and I think one can do that while also maintaining the passion of the scientists. I mean, the two are not irreconcilable, and frankly, what's exciting is to be in a time where one can imagine balancing those two. Right. I love your talk. Um, yeah. So you and I were at the same meeting of deans when um, Francis Collins came and mm. really misdirected his talk and focused almost exclusively. 
exclusively on precision medicine. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of people in public health mm -hmm. now adopting precision public health. Oh, yes. Kind of trying to be more precision than mm -hmm. the um, basic scientists. But do you think that, I assume you think that's a mistake and that we should not try to um, emulate mm -hmm. precision medicine in public health? Or do you think there's a place for it? Yeah. Yeah, so on, uh, on May 3rd, I'm uh, doing a webinar debate with Dr. Mu and Kuri about this notion of precision public health. Unfortunately for me, answering your questions, I haven't fully thought through my comments yet. But, <laughs> <laughs> but luckily, one of our faculty sent me a lovely note saying, I saw you're doing this debate, so here is what I think the answer. <laughs> she will get to know that very quickly. Uh, the, um, is this being taped? <laughs> I uh, the notion of precision public health at the core is in this one. And uh, the, 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 if, uh, as I understand the notion, it is that we will be able to identify the subgroups of subgroups who are more amenable to particular preventive interventions, which is, it, it takes the notion of public health and essentially equates it with a secondary <coughs> prevention idea. I would argue that public health and population health thinking more broadly is far more than secondary prevention and far more than the precision targeted approach towards um, particular secondary prevention approaches would suggest. So in that respect, I, I actually understand the impulse as to why we in public health have been trying to uh, um, sort of claim this juggernaut as wrong because it's like it's like this 800 pound gorilla coming at us and like stomping us and what's like with like bugs underneath it. Um, uh, but I am not sure that, uh, that co-option is the right approach. I think the right approach here is resistance. And I think, uh, again, I think precision medicine thinking is cool. I get, I get, I get cool. I like cool. Um, uh, and uh, it can lead to some mechanistic insight. And I think it can make a contribution that way. But do not. Let's not pretend it's going to improve the health of populations. I mean, my challenge um, uh, to Dr. Collins' cell of precision medicine is this challenge that says precision medicine is going to improve the health of populations. I think there's absolutely no evidence that that's the case. Now, I've been asked the question, well, do you think that the million person cohort could be useful for health populations? Well, maybe, okay, fine, if you go over and there's problems with the cohort, but sure. But that's in some respects almost incidental. But the notion that we are going to barrel ever deeper into genetic molecular determinants that might, by the way, be helpful for us treating some somatic cancers, which again, when I get one of those somatic cancers, I would like to have precision medicine treatment. It's good, it's great. But to say that it's going to help us improve the health of populations or narrow um, um, health inequities, I, I have seen not a single convincing argument about that. Yes? So I'm a student here. So in the spirit on, of uh, your comment about activist population health science, and yeah. how, to, how, to, how to do that right, um, I'm, I'm sure I'm misquoting both professors this past week that have been speaking about policy. Um, but you know, on the one hand, you've got not getting involved until peer review was published, and a, and a sufficient body is, yeah. is there. And on the other hand, um, maybe most policy is actually driven by a combination of nepotism and bribery. You know, not not that extreme. But right. they're not everybody's. Not everybody else is waiting for uh, peer review. So. How do you help drive policy with integrity, but not constantly lag it by a decade <coughs> for waiting for that body of literature to come out, especially as industry is influencing that policy at the same time? And, uh, how do you do that? Yeah, well, I think, it, I think, um, I think you can't do everything. I think you need to decide what your role is and what role comes to play. I think if you decide that your role is in the academic world, you have to accept the fact there are lags, and the academic world is not fills a very particular role, which is the pr production of knowledge in a rigorous way that stands peer scrutiny, and that can improve our knowledge base and our idea space. And um, it, is a, it is, in some respects, a weak tool against uh, larger political cultural forces, but um, you know, universities are the only institution to have survived for centuries together with the, you know, the church. Um, so there's reason to believe that um, the long arc approach that universities take has uh, staying power and has deep influence. It's frustrating when you compare it then with, um, for example, the relatively cheap currency of, uh, of cable television talk and seeing that being influential. And I think one needs to ask myself which aspect of influence does one want to embrace? I think if the pace 
the kind of world. By the way, I'm not excusing the fact that there's a lot of things we can do to improve the pace of the or the world and peer review and all that, leaving that aside. But I think one needs to decide, and you're still a student, you have the luxury of actually choosing still, in that um, if, um, if the, the, the tempo at which the academic world is going to influence policy is not something that you want to embrace, then I think it's, it is appropriate for you to embrace a different approach. Um, ultimately, if one is going to do it within the academic world, one has to recognize the constraints of working with it. That is not to excuse the constraints and to say the constraints are uh, immutable. I think we can do things to fix those constraints, but at the end of the day, it is there are systems in place and checks and balances to maintain rigor and uh, that inevitably result in a much slower pace than one is going to have at, uh, in venues where talk and opinion and exposition trump science. So I think one should choose where one wants to make a mark, trying to optimize the environment. And this is why I frame my talk saying, you know, I have made my bed in the academic world. And uh, as a result, I think my responsibility to try to say, how can we improve what we do? I mean, one could give a talk that is much more influential and important than mine, which says, how can we do a better job? It's a, it's a different, it's a different job, it's a different engagement, it's a different set of satisfactions, and one could argue it is a thinner, flimsier set of constructs, far thinner, far flimsier than the constructs that we can build and promote in the academic world. So I'm, I'm uh, bullish on the potential of the academic world. I'm even more bullish on the potential of the academic world if we improve it. And that's what I'm trying to do. So, so last, last question. Yeah, Sandra, thank you for having me here. Um, the title of your talk has a word that's very important to anthropologists, mm -hmm. not anthropologists, the context. Mm -hmm. You also talked about culture and context. So my question is, um, how can anthropologists and others who are deep in the community are really trying to get underneath the what's and help us understand the why's, how can they work with epidemiologists? And is that part of what you see should happen? Well, I know social epidemiologists use mixed methods like that, but I'm talking about the larger thing. Um. I think that falls into my notion of by any method necessary. Um, I don't care. What, I, I'm, I'm completely methodologically agnostic. Um, I think uh, my goal is to understand the cause of population health, so we can do something about it. I think that's the role of the school of public health. And uh, I think uh, we should have uh, room under the tent for anthropologists and epidemiologists, etc. At the same time, we have, we have the reality. We have to train our students to something. We have to give our students, students are here for five years. They won't be here for 10, probably. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe your students do. But um, <laughs> so it's fine. Like, why not? I think we need to be very careful about the knowledge that we impart on our students. And I think we need, to, we need to make sure, most importantly, that we teach our students how to think so that when they actually get out in the real world, they can figure out how to integrate methods from all places and be nimble enough and smart enough to um, embrace methods that emerge after they graduate. Uh, so. Is that the Absolutely. I think, I think you bring a set of um, methods so that you know, just don't learn. And uh, again, coming back to the definition, we're ultimately about understanding the cause of population, not so we need to do something about it. That tells me that we should, um, that part of that methodological tool should be in the to address it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.